know that we are in a climate emergency, but does science really suggest that the collapse of civilization is imminent? How are we to make sense of the unfolding crisis whilst at the same time navigating our lives in meaningful ways? Should we join the activists and rage against the dying of the light? Should we relinquish all hope of a future? Is despair a prerequisite for action? And does hope serve a useful purpose in these increasingly desperate days? In this video and in part two, I'll be talking about these questions and more with Tom Nicholas and Galen Hall, two young scientists and Extinction Rebellion activists who with Colleen Schmidt wrote a penetrating and damning critique of deep adaptation published in Open Democracy and The Ecologist. Now the idea of deep adaptation caused something of a stir two years ago because it asserted that we face inevitable near-term societal collapse and that we need to prepare for civil unrest, lawlessness and a breakdown in normal life. It argues that despair can be transformative if we can only overcome our fear of despair. But the article was also rejected for publication on numerous grounds and many scientists have been highly critical of the article. For instance, I asked Michael Mann, arguably the world's foremost climate scientist, for his views on deep adaptation. And he responded, unwarranted doomism as promoted by the so-called deep adaptation movement is as great a threat as outright denial, since it leads us down the same path of inaction. We'll hear more from Michael and other scientists and scholars through the interview. But first, let's hear from Tom and Galen themselves. Well, hello, Tom and Galen, um, and thank you so much for agreeing to talk with me today. We're going to discuss today your critique of deep adaptation, um, which has generated a lot of interest and has met with a range of reactions. Many of them have been constructive and positive from a wide range of scientists and environmentalists. But some of those comments and criticisms have been rather negative, defensive and even disparaging. And we'll have a look at some of the, the reactions to your critique in a little while. First of all, though, I just wanted to say a little bit about the fact that I personally feel slightly awkward um, as someone who was initially drawn into the deep adaptation um, framework and to the idea that collapse, societal collapse is somehow inevitable. Um, in a sense, deep adaptation embraces despair and sees it as potentially transformative if we can only overcome the fear of despair itself. And I personally find myself torn between wanting to just run for the hills um, as, a, as an initial reaction to hearing someone express with certainty that the collapse of civilization was inevitable. So I was torn between that reaction and also wanting to, to stay and actually engage with activism um, and engage with Extinction Rebellion in particular. But as I became more familiar with the climate science and as I spoke to climate scientists and I heard their reactions to deep adaptation, I started to realise that there was something wrong. Um, the summary of the science is the core of the paper. And it seemed to me that when the world's leading climate scientists were saying there's a problem, that we should really take note and listen to them. So Galen, I understand that you've had a rather similar experience. Yeah, I think you summarized some of the things, some of the reaction that I had to deep adaptation initially quite well. So I, I felt very similar. I think I read the paper about a year and a half ago. So it was, I think it would have been midwinter basically. Um, and the the IPCC's report on 1.5 degrees had come out in the in the autumn, and so I, I was kind of freaked out by that, like most people were. And there was also a sense of disillusionment with institutions like the uh, the COP conferences, so just feeling like those had been going on for decades and not accomplishing anything, and a sense of disillusionment with the ideologies that support that in action and kind of back it up. And deep adaptation, I think, calls those out in a way that appealed to me very well at the time. And so I did feel like, oh my God, knowing very little about the science when I read it, um, this guy's right. Everything I'm reading here aligns with what, how I feel. Um, so I really should take this claim that collapse is inevitable seriously. And it took a while and it took a lot, it took, courses and talking with professors and actually learning more about climate science um, to understand that the science in deep adaptation, which is sent, he's, you know, the paper says explicitly is central to the argument 
it's just completely wrong. And so once I sort of, there are other things, but once I realized that, um, I sort of broke from the, from the paper and I realized how much was wrong with it. Thank you. Thank you for, for telling us about that. It has been influential and it's influenced a, a huge number of people. Um, and I'm aware that some like, like you and like me are now calling into question the, the very premise of the, of the article. Um, I wonder if Tom, perhaps, if you could say something to us initially about, about why you decided to write this paper at this particular point and, and was the timing important in any way or was it something that you, you felt you wanted to, to write? Um, we, it took quite a while to write this, partly because we were very, very careful with the claims. Um, but on the other hand, it did still feel important to get it out while everybody's thinking about how to so-called build back better and all the rest of it, um, how to take advantage of the um, shift in thinking that uh, the pandemics caused. Um, I think it was also seeing the effect, like the ongoing effect of deep adaptation, like seeing that these ideas weren't going away uh, and that I'd hoped that they had. And in some cases, some groups were better and then others, but the ideas still had not disappeared. Uh, but also seeing the effect on friends as well. Um, I know more than one person whose mental health was deeply affected in a very negative way by the paper. Um, and it was only once someone clarified some of the scientific claims in particular that um, they were able to sort of break free from that. So that was another motivation. Great, thank you. Galen, would you like to add anything in terms of your, your motivations for contributing and, and helping write this paper? Sure. So shortly after I read Deep Adaptation, I was studying in Oxford at the time and I came back home to Boston, Massachusetts and started working with the local Extinction Rebellion group to help them get off the ground. So they'd already been doing lots before I got there, but I tried to help run the first Heading for Extinction talks and that kind of thing. Um, within that group, there were kind of two types of people. There were, most people were totally freaked out by climate change, rightfully, totally angry at our governing institutions that, you know, rightfully, um, but did think that there are things we can do and did believe that rat, like some sort of radical systemic change is possible. And then there was a minority of people who still showed up at all the events, but were vocally saying um basically none of this is worth it and we shouldn't we should not be we don't need to be out in the streets we should be basically preparing all together um for some kind of collapse and partly because i came back and was running helping to run trainings because i'd received a training and giving the talk when i was in the uk i had to deal with those sort of doomist minority within this group and it really took a huge impact on me and um and at the time, I was still kind of under the sway of deep adaptation. So it was only months later, having read a lot more and looking back, that I realized how damaging that had been, um, you know, not just for my own mental health to deal with, but like mostly for the mental health and outlook of the people who were still under the sway of that view. And that, I sort of finally realized that right when we started writing this paper. It became more important, I think, when COVID hit because having a clear understanding of what the political drivers of instability are is important in a time like, I mean, only gets more important the more destabilized things become. And deep adaptation just clearly is obscuring that kind of understanding. So that I would, was the second motivation for me. Thank you. Thank you. You explained that clearly. And, and some of those comments resonate with my own experience um, in that when I've encountered people who who are, I mean, doomism is an unfortunate term, but it, it's you know has some currency. But there seems to be a particular resistance to hearing anything that that contravenes their their worldview. There seems to be a reluctance to even reassess and re-examine. And I think it, it does seem somewhat unhealthy. Um, and let's move on to the reactions to your article. Um, and they've been, you know, by and large, really quite amazing. You've had some incredible um endorsements from from very eminent people uh, i'll start with with james murray as an as an example editor of business green who says he finally got around to reading this article and it's as good as everyone is saying which is fantastic um, we have george monbiot the environmentalist and writer saying 
we have to get the science right. And he's, he's disseminated the article. Um, Richard Betts from the Met Office and an IPCC author, so someone who clearly knows the climate science, remarked that doomist messages misrepresent the science, they're flawed, and they undermine the cause of those who want climate action. So it gives a sense of the frustration that climate scientists have felt about deep adaptation and, and, and the flawed science. Jonathan Watts, the Guardian's environment correspondent, says pitch perfect and scientifically robust, which is a great endorsement. Mike Berners-Lee, scientist and writer, agrees with your point, saying that deep adaptation overstated the inevitability of disaster, uh, was re rejected by peer review for good reason and is needlessly demotivating. And, and numerous scientists such as Michael Mann have either recommended or commented favourably on the article. But when we look to the, um, the, the originator of deep adaptation to see the kind of response that, that your article um, elicited, then there was a posting of a lengthy piece which, which essentially complained that you had misrepresented deep adaptation and then repeated some points that had previously been made that, that your article had in fact addressed because I know that you had in fact looked at the critiques of deep adaptation and, and, and Bendel's responses to those. Um, but he then went on to say, um, or to in fact to ask you to confirm that you hadn't received payments from a pro-nuclear personal body, which was a rather bizarre comment, uh, which was roundly criticised, and rightly so, I feel, by some, including Professor Mark Maslin, um, for appearing to seek to discredit you both before engaging with the substance of your article. Um, so you've had a, a range of reactions there to, to the article, some, as I say, very you know, constructive and, and supportive and, and others less helpful. Would you, would you like to give some comments on your reactions to those, rea those, um, those comments on your, on your work? Yeah, so we're obviously very pleased to see people reacting positively and especially um, sharing it because part of the reason that we wanted to write the response was so that there would be two sides to the debate um, so that if people found themselves in the same situation that Galen did in his local XR group, then they would have something to point to. Um, but I was very confused by the, well, essentially accusations um, around nuclear. I mean, they were clearly aimed at me because I'm the only person out of all of the different people who contributed to that piece who has any link whatsoever to nuclear. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a UK funded PhD student. Um, but I was also, I wasn't just confused by the fact that it seems to imply that I was the only author. I mean, I really wasn't. Um, me and Galen wrote a lot of it, but we spent a lot of time getting feedback from many, many people, including, as you mentioned, Richard Betts, who's head of climate impacts at the Met Office, Julia Steinberger, who's an uh, ecological economist um, and <laughs> fervent anti-capitalist, <laughs> Um, and a bunch of other scientists too. Um, so it was a little bit odd to see it sort of class as if I'd written the whole thing. But I was also just confused in a simpler way because it's not hard to find out who I am. Like if you just Google my name followed by the word physics, then you immediate the first like four results or something are all things that I've written. So I'm, I'm still confused by that. Okay. Um, we yes. Were also, sorry. Um, we we're also a little, it was also a little bit disappointing because we tried throughout the article very hard to make clear arguments um, backed up with links and references to the original um, deep adaptation papers text or any other ref or any other anything else that was relevant. So then and then get that all double checked. Um, and so it was a bit disappointing to see that instead of a critical engagement, like one of the first responses was an immediate like ad hominem attack on one of the authors. Yes, and I think we'll, we'll return to that a little later when we look at some other comments and critiques that have been, have been made of deep adaptation um, and the possibility that there's in fact a pattern emerging in terms of how um, the, the author of the deep adaptation paper responds to criticism. Um, but, but at this point, I'd just like to remind people watching that, 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 that you are both, and Colleen Schmidt, who's your, your co-author who was unable to be here today, um, a, a very career young and is vital, I, I feel, that the scientific community supports and in fact celebrates young talent, particularly when you have the courage to, to step up and to tackle a challenging issue 
as constructively and meticulously as you have done. And I feel that some some people out there could, could learn quite a lot from the way in which you've engaged with this topic. And I think your conduct in terms of dealing with the, the criticism um, of all kinds that's been levied at you. Um, okay, so let's, let's move on and look at the actual um, content of the paper. So your paper outlines in great detail a number of problematic aspects of the science as set out in deep adaptation. And this is important because as, as Ben Dell himself says, the summary of science is the core of the paper. And I wondered if you could say something to us um, about the, the key problematic areas as you see it. I mean, there are a number of them outlined, but perhaps if you pick on one or two that you see as being absolutely key. Galen, um, would you like to, sorry. Sure. Galen, sure, would you like to start? Start us off, yeah, and, and Tom, feel free to butt in. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the sort of in-depth summary of the science is available on the open democracy piece, so I don't want to get too into the into the weeds here, but um, right, as you said, in I think it was in the letter to the editor following the on the actual paper, uh, the author says that the summary of the science is key to the paper. All the other conclusions follow from the summary of the science. There are two or maybe three really crucial problems with the science. Um, so you can, there are different ways you can sort of divide them up. Uh, but the way we do it in the paper is, or in the, in the open democracy piece is, there are two claims, two specific scientific claims that are supposed to point us towards the conclusion about collapse. And those are that um, there's gonna be massive methane release from the Arctic that's gonna initiate a feedback loop. Um, and the Arctic sea ice is, the decline of Arctic sea ice is going to contribute to a similar feedback loop where warming is going to be outside of human control, which is a crucial point. Um, and then maybe the third thing you could say is that there's a general framing, about, there's general talk about nonlinearity as well. So they, these are nonlinear processes. We need to look at the most recent data to see how they're changing in real time. And um, only if we do that can we understand what's coming. So all three of those claims are they're more or less completely false, at least the way that they're framed in the article. There are feedback, those feedback loops do exist. They're just not outside of human control. And the evidence cited for that claim is uh, extremely dubious. The talk of nonlinearity is sort of more even directly false. So the understanding of nonlinearity and the way it's invoked in the article is kind of an esoteric topic, but it is a crucial mistake to think that we can look at near time data and then extrapolate outwards to see so that if there's been a recent spike in say methane we can expect that to be the beginning of an exponential increase um it reminds me of the period ending in 2015 when there is a lull in the increase in global temperatures and climate deniers sort of said look it's all over global warming has stopped um but in fact, there's just internal variability in the climate system, and that comes up all over the place. So those are really the three main things. And Tom, I'd go ahead and add anything. I mean, everything that Galen's just said, it, the, the, the open democracy piece lays out the detailed criticism. But I think while we were writing it, one of the main things I was surprised by, by it was just the, the very, very low quality of the sources used for very, very large claims. Um, I would I would kind of go through the references, follow the chains of links on the internet, and end up on something that just clearly was like conspiracy level um, denier like site, which just obviously shouldn't be taken seriously. And then that was being used to criticise a six hundred page IPCC report, which involved thousands of scientists. And I, I think I. I when we initially started writing it, then I knew that there were problems with the claims, but then the more I looked into it, the more I was surprised at how weakly supported some of these claims were. Um, but we explain like how, how the original paper uses techniques that are familiar to people who've had to deal with climate denialists in order to make it look as if these claims have more merit than they actually do. Thank you. I think you put that very well. Um, I wonder if, if a part of the problem, at least, is that um, we have someone who is not a climate scientist making these very bold claims 
and trying to evaluate what is an incredibly complex body of information um, and, and, and probably inadvertently coming to conclusions that are simply not supported and, and, and not, not warranted and not, um, not evidenced by, by the data. So it's, and I feel that it's, it's, it's a, you know, others, I think, fall into a similar sort of trap. You know, people who are scientists, but outside of that, that you know, outside of the, the, the climate science domain, um, who, who make, make judgments and, and make statements, bold statements about um, what might actually happen in the future based on a very um, inadequate understanding of, of the situation. Um, yes, and um, I, I noticed that Gavin Schmidt um, has commented on some of the claims, um, saying that the claims made in deep adaptation about runaway climate change are, are nonsense. Um, Miles Allen, another scientist, Wrote, wrote a paper fairly recent showing that the keeping warming to 1.5 degrees is still geophysically possible. Um, and I think the point that, that, that is made here is that there is a difference between um, what's happening within the climate system and then what's happening in terms of human contributions to that. Um, and it seems that hard as it hard and, and, and almost impossible as it might be, it seems that there is still scope for us to, to act and to, to react appropriately. Um, which completely undermines the claim that um, that, that near-term societal collapse mm. is inevitable. There's a there's a claim made in the deep adaptation paper specifically that there is no effective response, which is problematic in a number of ways. Not just in terms of mitigation of emissions. I mean, if warming is not runaway, then reducing emissions reduces warming, and that is an, always an effective response. But it's also problematic in terms of adaptation as well like there are it, it, it's true that there are some damages that we can't really prevent like coral reefs are going to die out on mass pretty much whatever we do at this point but there are other forms of impacts that we can lessen the damages of quite significantly um, and the and the ipcc writes hundreds of pages about this like it's again an example of a huge body of evidence that's dismissed with a throwaway line Yes, and in fact, I think again that that that's another good point in that um, some of the IPCC authors who um, who advise Extinction Rebellion have been really quite indignant, and I think it's a fair response. They've been quite indignant at the way in which the IPCC expertise is dismissed. Um, clearly, there are problems with the IPCC and its processes, but I think it's a mistake to throw the baby out with the bathwater in a sense. Thank you for listening to part one of my conversation with Tom and Galen. Part two will be forthcoming shortly. Feel free to like, share, leave a comment and subscribe to our channel. Thank you.